Welcome everyone from the Agni basement in, in Boston uh, to this evening's conversation. I'm William Pierce, co-editor of Agni with Sven Burkertz, and we're very glad to have you here. Throughout 2022, Agni and the independent bookstore Brookline Booksmith are celebrating the magazine's 50th anniversary with a series of six intimate virtual conversations. Each pairs one of our editors with a contributor who, whose work defines for them the ever-evolving Agni aesthetic. Something in the air, maybe it's the coming of fall, is calling us toward a relaxing evening, and we couldn't have a better pairing for it tonight. Mary O'Donohue, our senior fiction editor, joined the magazine more than a decade ago after first having stories of her own published here. Her fiction has appeared in Granta, Kenyan Review, The Irish Times, Dublin Review, and more. She's published a novel and two poetry collections and also translates Irish language poetry. For the coming spring semester, she'll have a deserved and prestigious break from her teaching at Babson College to be Heimbold Chair of Irish Studies at Villanova University. It was Mary in her work as, as a uh, constant, constantly vigilant uh, surveyor of the scene who brought Maurice's writing to Agni. At first, his story, The Children of New Orleans. This June, his story collection, The Ones Who Don't Say They Love You, was released and became a New York Times editor's choice. And he is a novel, I'm sorry, he's the author of a novel that takes on race in a moving and very unsettling, productively unsettling way. We Cast a Shadow, which was a finalist for the Penn Faulkner Award and the Dayton Literary Peace Prize and long listed for the International Dublin Literary Award. He's a professor of creative writing at, Los, at Louisiana State University and a, uh, a real hero of mine as a fiction writer. I both are, and, and I can't wait for this conversation. Thank you for being here, both of you. Thank you so much for having me. Um, yeah, shout out to Acme because I'm one of those people who was uh, a reader of the magazine for years. And um, to have, Mary picked my story back in 2015. I just kept like just scratching my head, like how does this even happen? How do you go from being somebody who loves a magazine for what's in it, having your own work in it? So if I sound a little confused right now, it's because um, seeing everybody here, it, it feels kind of surreal. Thank you for having me tonight. It's so cool. We're so happy that you are with us, Maurice, and that everybody is joining us this evening um, in, in our audience and and you know I'm going to say this because you told me this a day or two ago. I think, am I right, that we are close to your birthday, that tomorrow is tomorrow your birthday. So That is true. Yeah. Well, I thank you for even more for giving us your, your presence this evening on the eve of your birthday. Um, it feels like a, a special thing to do um, with, with Agni. Yeah. When that's, and it's 2015, which is a long time ago, you know, seven years ago, which everything feels like yesterday to me it's kind of the getting old thing um but yes I remember that story crisply and clearly because of its crispness its clarity um and the the shock of language that that story brought to to Agni uh, and and we loved it um and the children of New Orleans in a way though it's not in this story collection and we'll talk about your story collection later uh I, it, it presides, I think, over the stories in the ones they don't say you, they love you, all, all of whom, all of which stories could be children of New Orleans and are in, in their own way. Um, now that we've gotten birthday announcements <laughs> past us, uh, I, uh, I'd love us to, to, to jump in and talk about the openings, the big, the openings, I will say, not beginnings, the openings of both your novel in terms of the shock that the first chapter brings immediately to, to the reader and the short story collection where the title story, the ones they don't say, say they love you is the first story in that collection. And that is not always the case. We often have to wait in story collections for the, the, the reveal uh, of the title story, it often comes later in the collection, but not not in your case. You wanted that story to be to be the first story. Um, so I wondered if maybe you would grace us with a reading 
from from the first chapter of the novel um, and to, and we'll talk a little bit about what what I'm kind of thinking about and what you were thinking about um, in starting this way. My pleasure to do so. And here's the book. Those of you, oh, yep, both covers, uh, hardcover and paperback. All right. Um, I never know where to stop when I start from the very beginning, so I'll just read a couple of minutes and stop where it feels appropriate. One, my name doesn't matter. All you need to know is that I'm a phantom, a figment, a man who was mistaken for waitstaff twice that night, I given my outfit. I managed to avoid additional embarrassment by wallflower in the shadow of the grand staircase. Their cheeks pink from southern comfort, the partner, or shareholders, as the firm called them, stood chatting in clusters around the dining room. I had been invited by my law firm's leaders to attend their annual party at Octavia Whitmore's mansion on the Avenue of Streetcars. It was a highlight of my life, an honor for a lowly associate just to be invited. I was surprised to be told to show up in costume. Rough fabric chafed against my collarbone. I was dressed as a Roman centurion. I had rented the mega deluxe option. No expense spared, full tonic of lamb's wool, leather sandals, and five, count them five, Hollywood prop grade weapons. A sword, a javelin, a bow and arrow, a shield, and a dagger. I never knew that Roman soldiers used daggers, but the costume guy assured me that they did too use daggers. The dagger being the preferred weapon of choice for when shit got real which apparently it did from time to time. The first floor of Octavia's mansion was a series of large rooms. Playful notes of sandalwood and jasmine lingered in the foyer. I spotted my fellow black associate, Franklin, beyond the entryway. Franklin, who got white girl drunk at every function, karaoke, I feel pretty into a microphone. Franklin had come wearing the perfect icebreaker. He wore a white smock and a black bow tie. The uniform of every black bus boy and waiter at every old line restaurant in the city. Cafe, Refugee, Carnation Rum, Pierre's. No, not Pierre's. There were no brothers at Pierre's. I wasn't sure what must have been more mortifying for Franklin, that he was singing so poorly or that no one paid him any mind. It couldn't have helped that he was too black and pretty. My frenemy, good old backslapping Riley, was bent over the table, giving the managing shareholder, Jack Armbruster, a foot massage. Sweat made Riley's bald head glow. He looked like a scoop of chocolate ice cream melting under the parlor lights. Riley was dressed as a parish prison inmate, which ranked with my sense of propriety. They saw enough of us dressed that way in news reports. However, I had to admit it was an impressive getup. He wore a day glow orange jumpsuit and even a fake chest tattoo. He carried clanking leg shackles slung over his shoulders if ready to re incarcerate himself on the quest. Raleigh was working the old farts feet, feet so gnarly it seemed like roots ripped from the field behind the mansion. He dabbed his dome with a handkerchief. Was a promotion and bonus worth the kind of humiliation Franklin and Raleigh were undergoing? Confetti rained down on the junior shareholders in the adjacent hall. You betcha. My son Nigel's procedure would be expensive. After feeding the snarling three-headed beast of mortgage, utilities, and private school tuition, I only managed to pocket a few copper coins each month. If I were promoted, or earn a fat bonus, and Nigel would finally get a normal face over his mother's objection. Thank you, Maurice. This opening, this tough opening that gives a moment of relief when I heard those weapons that came with the Roman centurion's outfit right I found myself okay I can breathe now <laughs> there's a there's there's a laugh here that I probably shouldn't be having but but 
the author is granting this to me and the narrator is granting this to me. I'd love to know um, what went into the composition of this opening, which is of a competition, right? Um, for which the law associates, three black men working in this law firm are competing for a promotion. And for the narrator, this promotion means most, most everything that he wants which is to say to be able to provide this skin operation for his son whom he's worried is developing um, a black stain that is becoming more and more prominent um, in his view as the novel goes on tell me about this opening was this always the opening was this what you knew would be happening immediately that we joined the novel well it, it took a while to get there um for me whenever i'm writing the book, it's a, it's a process of evaluation and exploration. And I didn't know what the book was about initially. In the earliest drafts, he was this kind of Philip Roth type character who is a professional in the city trying to make his way in the you know, in career, that kind of thing. And then um, I wrote this chapter where he is at a work function and it was very sort of even. It wasn't designed to make you feel a certain kind of way. It was sort of descriptive. He's at a party, you know, his bosses are there, yada, yada, yada. And then one night I just I had this feeling of, you know, what is this man's attitude I and mean, what is he trying to accomplish? And by that point, I had figured out that he is a family man who's trying to uh, protect his family, and protect his son. I was like, well, well, from what? You know, what were the problems here? And of course, you know, he's a black man, so his son is black as well. And as a big fan of Ellison's, um, Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man, you know, there's that one boxing scene, which is such an astonishing scene on so many levels. And um, I'm very much the kind of writer who loves to pay homage to what I to what I enjoy as a reader. So this first chapter is kind of a combination of two or three things. Um, you know, definitely there is the uh, "My Name Doesn't Matter," which is a sort of echo of uh, Moby Dick. So you know, call me Ishmael. Then there's this sort of competition between the various um, black men, which is a callback to Invisible Man. And then there's a bit of, of you know, Morrison, where she has this way of like just getting you into a space and sort of laying it out in this intriguing way. And you think you know what's going on. It sort of shifts it a few times. Um, and then also Lolita, where there's this sort of charming narrator who's kind of up to no good. And, and you kind of know something's not quite right there, but you're, but you're sort of laughing along. You're sort of just going like, tell me more. I want to hear what's going on. Lola, oh, well, that is, this is a surprise to me, but now that you mention it, um, that, that now I'm starting to sort of hear that and see it in there. Um, the, the seductive narrator who is, you know, bringing us along um, and, and sometimes we go unwillingly to the places um, that he's going and, and where he's compelling his son to go as well, because the narrator's voice is so pressing, so compelling. Um, we can't not listen at the same time as we know not a whole lot about him, at least early in, in the book. So, the, I mean, I think you've, I think that's a really interesting um, consideration. We love to hear the kind of influences under the skin of a text of fiction and, and not all writers um, are as generous in providing them as, as you have been in, in those. Um, and, then, and then I'm thinking also about the opening story in your short story collection. Um, the ones who don't say they love you, which is a, a very different voice. Um, this is a voice, this is a sex worker. Um, foster care is, is a part of the discourse of this as well. And I would love to know something of the composition of that story. And I would love to hear a little of that as well. Um, but let's maybe talk our way into it first of all, before you, before you read some of it, because it's, it's an amazing beginning to a short story collection. Once you have that story there at the beginning as a reader, you're under a spell. Um, and I think that this collection itself is uh, certainly one of the best I've read probably in the last 10 years. It's splendid and, and more people need, do need to read this book. Um, I know that it came out in 2021, which doesn't mean that, that COVID, you know, uh, took a whole lot away from it, but I, I do want it to have maybe a longer life than, than it might have had because, because of COVID. Tell me something about opening the collection with that story, the ones who don't say they love you, and then who are the ones who don't say they love you? in this story. Yeah, you know, um, that story very much, I think it had to be the title story. I, I wasn't certain when we were putting the collection together. My editor, Nicole Counts at um, One World Random House, mm -hmm. you get to a point where um, you almost can't see your own manuscript anymore. I just told her, 
you know, like send me a playlist. Like if you were gonna make the order of stories, Miss Miss, just send to me and we'll talk about it afterwards. And she put the story first, which I was kind of surprised about, but um, I understood it because um, I'm the kind of writer who, you know, I, I want a reader to know what they're getting into with my work. You know, my work has a very particular voice. Um, you know, going back to what I just read, there's sort of playfulness in the, in the language. I don't want readers to sort of get halfway into one of my books and kind of go, oh, this is not for me. And so I like the idea, like with many albums, where the first song is one of the stranger songs, the more aggressive songs, of, like the strongest tea in the sort of box of various kinds of tea you drink. So, you know, with this story, it's got everything that, 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 that I like to do, um, at least in, in this collection. You know, this is a story that represents um, the citizens through children, like much of the book does. And it represents this feeling of a city that has, uh, you know, many economic issues and, and race issues, but at the same time, these characters are very self-contained. They know who they are, and they have a lot of spunk, and they have a lot of heart. Um, even somebody like this main character in the story who you know, is in foster care, he knows who he is, and he has this sort of um, this sort of North Star. I mean, the fact that he is a sex worker who has like you know almost no money, he cares for the foster kids who are younger than him, and I think that that's telling you who he really is. I think a lot of my characters are like that, regardless of their own material circumstances. They're trying to do the best for the people around them. And um, he's just a great version of that. And his voice you know, is very particular. I mean, it, it's something that when I was writing the story, um, I'm not sure where it came from. I just think that a lot of the stories' voices are, the, are sort of the voices or sort of mixtures of voices of people I've known in my life in the city. Because New Orleans has such a unique influence, whether it be uh, you know, the Haitian and West African influences, whether it's the French or the, the Irish, or the Italian is such a sort of melange of, of linguistic influences. And this character has all of that. He sounds a bit like you know, Lil Wayne, and Irma Thomas, and Louis Armstrong, all bound into one person. And that's why he's this sort of staccato rhythm in his voice when he talks. To would you read, would you read from, from the story so we can hear, hear that, that, that melange? Be happy to. And this is the uh, cover of it. Um, the, uh, yep. I think I have a paperback. And that's the paperback. Covers are very different, but to me, they both represent the book very well. Oh, it's um, lovely. I haven't seen the, oh, that's lovely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this one is very, like, sort of obviously New Orleans with the, with the sort of cottage yeah. house and yeah. the, the Caribbean colors, which is very New Orleans. And then this one, you know, I think the concept for me was I wanted to have a cover that made the book look as this as though it had existed for 40 or 50 years already. Like you had seen it on your grandmother's shelf when you were a child. You open it up and you're like, oh, this, this feels like us um, in the city. So I'll read a few pages of this. And it's a very short story. Maybe I'll get to the end. Let's see how it feels. Yeah, yeah. It is, it is, it is a very short story. <clears throat> the ones who will say they love you. You're on the sidewalk out front of the convenience store. The sun beat down like they do every morning. The street cleaner passed by spray and lemonade smelling water. You get on your tennis shoes, shoes that's coming loose at the heel, so your socks get wet too. Soapy water drip down the curb. Not like this street to stay clean long. With the gentleman around the corner like he being dog. He ain't much to look at. It never is. You're like the other men who come down for foot fixing conventions and brain fixing conventions. He got a fat neck and skin like old peaches. His wallet fat too. That's all you care about. Jonik eye you from crotch to mouth. He pull out a pack, he smoke. You pull one from the pack and light yours with his. Why are you the only one out here this morning? He covered his eyes halfway. The sun glared from Mississippi River Bridge like, I see you, boy. I'm the only one you need, you say. True enough. The other tapper is already off to work probably almost done with the men they left with. They left you with the tip box, the boxes for your protection. We, you wear bottle caps on your soles and dance so people think you and the others are symbol monkey. A police car roll up the street, the lights flash blue, white, blue, but the car don't slow down even though the cop lean over to get an eye for your faces. Joe Nick's butt cheeks tense up. You could tell him you know, don't sweat it, but you like seeing him squirm. If you didn't like seeing him squirm, you would tell him the cops never arrest Johns, especially not Johns from out of fucking hole. What you do, probably make those cops puke. 
Make them stay away. It's easy to lock up dudes for shooting dudes. That's good business. Putting a junior high slut in jail, it's bad business. If they hear all about what you do, people stop coming to town. And you all starve then. The stoplight turned green. The police car pull off. Jelnick's ass relax. You don't really need to tap dance to stay out of jail. But if you don't at least fake it, what else you got? Jelnick, the only one who buy you food after you do his business. Now, you soar inside and out. You're starving too. The queen you cook behind the corner, kind of behind the counter is flipping pancakes. Maybe the pancakes will take your mind off how rough Jelnick handle you. Jelnick's toast and runny eggs come out first. You squirt ketchup all over it. You golf coffee, you get a refill, golf that too. He don't give you none. Your stomach growls. When you bring food to the corner, the other tappers take most of it, leave you the scrap. Most days you don't eat till you go home. Today you're hungry. What the shit is the holdup? The queen cooking back and your pancakes sitting on the cold side of the grill like a frisbee that just stopped spinning. Jelly been here all week. The first day he's sure up, he take Pink and Quincy first, one in the morning, the other around lunch. He come back for you at the noontime, rock up the street with his head stuck to his forehead. After he take a piece of you never buy with Pink and Quincy selling again. And that's a plus on top of that money. It's the only time you won when they around. It's too dark and your hair ain't good. Wavy like pink, but now you can laugh inside when you see them. You can't laugh out loud. They punch you if you smile. Johnny break out a roll of cash. He put down 20, two $20 bills. One for the food and one for you. 20 won't cover the food, so it'll come out of what you earn. When I leave tonight, Johnny say, I want you to come with me. He poured sugar in his coffee. His finger got ketchup on it that he don't see. He stirred his coffee with that finger. I'll get you a plane ticket, and I have a storage unit you can stay in until we find you something more appropriate. Man, you say, I ain't going to body Idaho. Listen to me, you say. You can do better than this place. It's not safe for you. Nobody around here mess with me, you say. He put a hand on your face where you bruised from when Pink hit you the other day. You flinch, and you like to flinch away. But you don't, because his hand feel warm. You don't know anything, Johnny say. I've been visiting New Orleans for over 20 years. You think you're one of the first boys to sit on that corner? What do you think happened to the boys who were there before you? You can tell Johnny about Pink's brother, Simi, who went puff like mad smoke last month. Simi was the first one you met when you came out here. He looked out for you, but now he's gone. You don't even go to Idaho. Why do you care what happened to me, you ask? Just be back at the corner around 6 p.m. with your personal belongings. I'll be in a great sport utility deal. When you're gonna get up, the stool squeal like it's being stabbed, but then your pancake, black and crusty, still down on that grill. The queenie cook wearing mascara and hoop earrings, so you know he'll pull on Mary. He flipped the pancakes to your plate, he smacked the plate down, sound like it cracked, but it don't, and shake his head at you like he's better than you. You want to jump over the counter and stop his face on the grill. You want to make him suck your junk. You want to make him say your name like he mean it, but he groan. He break you in five pieces and cry. You be on the wrong side like always. The pancake dark on you, you don't touch it. Snatch all that money and run. The cook yell after you, but those just words. When you go into the house with a box of chicken and biscuits and the rain back early from the casino downtown, she and her spot in front of the TV. She don't have no legs. You bought toilet paper and chocolate milk too. You don't pack groceries. She don't look up. She eating a bag of orange puffs. Her lips on. She keeps them on her lap so little kids won't get none of them. None of you like to get close to her. She grabs too hard. You go to the kitchen and put the chicken down. You yell out the back door for the little boys rolling in the grass by the flat tire pickup truck. The boys are foster boys like you. The rain got a check every two weeks for keeping y'all. You don't get any of that, but she called it rent. She take rent to the casino. If she went, she don't tell you. You gotta find your own, you say. But she eat what you bring home. Her cut, she called it. You go back to the kitchen, you open the box, and a roach in it. The little boys, they come in the back door, screaming and smacking each other, and you can't come see that roach, because they won't eat the chicken then. And you ain't got money to buy more. A little bit of chicken you brought in, enough for them anyway. You pop that bug in your mouth. 
Jonic storage must be pretty big. A big man wouldn't have a small shed. A big man would have a shed big enough to do cartwheels in. His condo in the French Quarter is small, but everything in the French Quarter is small. If everything was big, it'd be the French dollar. When you put you in position, you stare out the window. There's a tree outside with heart-shaped leaves. You count those leaves. You never get past 15. And all the times you've done business with Jelinek, you never say he loved you. And that's the only reason you listen, listen to him at all. The others always say they love you. You don't want to see Pink and Quincy at the corner. Instead, they're over there tap dancing extra fast. They're trying to rain the last little bit of pocket change out of the toys before it gets dark. The cops won't take you in for Huston Johns. They don't stand for curfew breakers. It don't look right for tapless to be on the street after dark. What don't look right is bad for business. Bottle caps spray concrete make you make you sick like you had a crate full of bottle caps. You wonder where Janix at. At the time, you wonder if you feel better when you come around. But where you been at, Quincy said. Not making any, I bet, Pink said. Ain't never got this shit together, this baby here. You tell them to suck a horse and they howl. Oh, you a suck a little bitch today, huh? You slow? You tell them you ain't slow. You tell them about to get paid. You tell them you're leaving with Joe Nick as soon as he get here. Humpty Dumpty? Quincy frowned. That man ain't bringing no ways, boy, Pink said. A gray SUV down the block. It looked like it's going to turn before it make it to you. Stop looking. Quincy, pinch your shoulder. You're serious, ain't you, big? Coming for me, you say. I bet you're 20, he ain't, Pink say. Pink wrestle you and snatch your last five from your pocket. It's only five. Pink say that'll do until you get more. You tell him you ain't lost yet. Pink say he good for the night and leave you with five. Leave with your five. You only have one bottle for you, shoot. But you're going to pass some time tapping. Make some change to buy a cold drink because your mouth tastes like funk. You dance till the cap break loose and roll into the gutter. Something flash. A police car creep your way. The lights beep slow. The car speed up. You can't see the cop driving, but hands and cuffs press on the backseat glass. Jelinek face behind those hands. Maurice, what I love so much about this story is all that the narrator is trying to manage here. And thank you for reading the full story, because I think it's necessary in order to show the management um, that, that the narrator is about, um, including right down to managing the chicken that goes home to the foster kids and eating the cockroach that's in the box as well. It's, it's a stunning story. Um, and it's a story about um, a possible departure that I think we know, given anything we kind of know about the short story form, um, means that we know it's probably not going to happen in this. And I love it as, as the opening to the collection, because I, I think it sets, it sets its course for what Frank O'Connor, the great short story writer and, and teacher also, um, used to think was the real business of the short story, which was to examine the lonely voice, and I'm quoting him, and many people here in this meeting will, will know these words, the lonely voice of a submerged population. These small, he said, in some cases, almost non-entity characters who, who, who get to have their day in a short story, um, however painful that may be. And I love that it's the beginning story. Um, and, and I love that your editor was the one who, <laughs> The one who did say that she loved it right up there at the beginning of, of the book. Um, so maybe we'll take a step back from that kind of close work that we've been doing and particularly um, your reading and thank you for that. And I, I'm wondering about your beginnings. We've talked about the beginnings of these books, um, but I'm wondering about your beginnings in fiction. Um, how fiction, why fiction, where fiction maybe we would say, and was it always fiction? Um, I'm very curious to know also in this about your teachers and mentors. Um, we have a number of teachers, I think, in the audience tonight as well, and I would count myself among them. I, I just, I love to know all of that stuff. Um, so your beginnings in fiction. Sure. Um, so, and thank you to everybody in the chat who said that they appreciate the story. You know, that was a tough one to read. I actually don't read it out loud very often. And I think it goes to my beginnings as a writer. I, you know, I think that um, for many of us who are fiction writers, um, 
one of the challenges is getting past inertia. Like you go to a blank page, you have no idea what you're going to write. And I think for me, the thing that's been my saving grace is this feeling of um, character often starts with voice. And I often think, all right, which voice is most insistent in my head? And so like that kid in that particular story is an example of a, a character who, you know, is based on people I've seen around the city. You know, there have been generations of tap dancers near um, uh, St. Louis Cathedral in the French Quarter. And sort of knowing what some of their backgrounds are like, it just makes me wonder, like, what, what is their life? You know, how do you wind up in a spot like that? And, and what do you like as a person? Um, my mentors, I mean, they're, they're legion, but one of my first mentors, a guy named James Nolan, probably in his early 70s now, and he was the person who told me that one of your main jobs is to get out of your own way. And I would often say, for example, you know, I'm, I'm trying to write this character in this novel who casts a shadow. And he feels like, you know, I feel like I can't move forward with this book because he seems so much like me in so many ways. And then he's, and he says, well, you know, I mean, a, this is not a new thing, but you have to otherize your stories. You have to have um, empathy for the character. And you have to take yourself out of it. And so I, I think for me, when I'm writing short stories in particular, but also novels, I'm trying to take myself out of the text. And so, you know, Wig has a shadow. He has some demographic similarities to me. He's a black male who's a lawyer from the South. But then it almost stops there. You know, I, um, you know the, 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 his dynamics in his work and his home life are much different from my dynamics. Um, and then, you know, even beyond that, what I noticed was it just makes the work a lot easier. I'm listening to a voice from some other multiverse. And I'm just sort of channeling what they're saying to me. I'm saying, tell me what your story is and leave the boring parts out and <laughs> get me to keep on listening to you. You know, don't bore me. You know, keep me on track. So if, if we're on an airplane flying, you know, uh, to California together, and I started zoning out, then that that you know, that person needs to perk up and give me more more verb in the story. So that's why, like in a lot of my um, uh, you know stories, they just sort of twist. Like if you're on a roller coaster, and it's a little a little wheels on the bottom that makes the roller coaster go fast at certain points. The stories are like that. If the energy is going down, I'm trying to bring it back up somehow. Um, and for me, you know, the idea of why fiction fiction is just so powerful. Um, you know, by this point, I've written in almost every form. I've, I've been writing a lot of poetry lately. I've written, um, you know, plenty of essays and prose. I've, you know, dabbled in screenplays. But when I think about fiction, particularly book-length fiction, you know, if you ask the, if you ask the average person, you know, which characters you re, you remember from literature, they'll name like a novel protagonist as opposed to maybe a short story protagonist. You spend so much time with these people. You know, whoever your favorite characters from a book, you may know that person better than you know like your best friend, for example, being inside of their head, seeing what their life is like, and seeing it in that constructive world. So fiction is very exciting because you know, there's the empathy of it, there's the discovery of it, there's the entertainment of it. Um, and as a writer, you know, anything's possible. I feel like with fiction, I can, I can help create people who maybe uh, have never existed, but who feel like, you know, they're your cousin or your best friend or, you know, somebody that you could have met a hundred years ago. And that's just a lot of fun to me. We're, we're kind of agitating for the people in our fiction too, right? Um, though they are, um, though they, they're of us, but they're not us. And then, and then we want to sort of um, make their case, I suppose. Um, I love that. I love what you said also about submerged population, with Frank O'Connor. I had never heard that phrase before, but that describes my entire mission. It's just New Orleans is often overlooked in literature. Yeah. Um, and that's a sort of two-sided thing where people are not looking for us. And then also people from the city have a hard time getting their work out. And so to yeah. be one of the people who's having this, this chance to show my community, it means a lot to me. Not just like, I don't even, not for the world to see us, but for people in my city to see us and go, oh, wow, look, we're in a story. And, they, and people will go, yeah. that sounds like us. That feels like us. I get very excited to think about that. Yeah, and, 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 and all of those are the characters in, in your stories. They feel real. Um, even in the shortest of stories, in a way, there's short stories in here for our audience that, that run to about a page and a quarter in some cases. I think of them as inter-stories um, to the bigger ones. And, and in those, a character emerges, kind of seizes us, and then is gone. Um, and then uh, somebody else might pick up that same kind of cause a little bit later in the book. Another character might. But I think it's marvelous how you work with the long and the short stories 
all in service of that lonely voice of the submerged population, as Frank O'Connor is thinking about. And there's a, and for anyone in the audience, and I know the, I, I know one of my dear friends, a poet, George Caligeris, um, showed up um, in the audience at the beginning here. There is one story that I will I will challenge readers who are new to your book to find um, that I think of utterly as a poem, not as a poetic story, um, but as a poem in your book. Um, it, it's in there. Um, it looks like a poem. It thinks like a poem, and it's it's stunning. So I'm I'm excited to hear that that you you've been writing poetry recently. This doesn't surprise me um, at all. Uh, I'm thinking about. Um, this sort of work that you're doing in both in both texts, uh, which is that of it's both kind of thinking of loneliness again, um, uh, as we have been, but also thinking of of trauma, and and I think that goes more to uh, thinking about your novel, um, and I, I'm 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 thinking back to an interview that you did with my dear colleague Jennifer Alice Drew here at Agni. It was published online in the Agni blog. Um, and you and she are thinking and wondering in one case about what this narrator is, is trying in his own trauma to teach his son in this novel. And I thought I found it a fascinating kind of question and, and thinking on the part of, of you both. And I'd love to hear you talk about how how you managed. And in some cases, he doesn't, I think, um, trauma in that novel. Yeah, you know. I remember that there was that debate um, in, in an essay last year about the, the trauma plot. That became a big topic of discussion. In, in oh, yeah, period. yeah. And I think to some extent, um, it's, almost it's almost impossible to imagine a literature that is devoid of trauma. So I think that the thing that sort of separates writers um, is how they process it. So you know, if the story is a bit more of a genre story where it's like a mystery or whatever, it's very externalized. You know, you know, maybe you don't even know what the, what the detective, um, what their personal hurt is. But if, if they can solve that crime, then that's gonna make them feel better, make you feel better in the story. And most of my stories in the novel, for example, I think that trauma is so deep seated and so pervasive because I'm really talking about American problems. I mean, worldwide problems also, but particularly when America deals with race and gender and um, class and those kinds of things. And so what happens is that I, I find myself trying to find like, where's the refuge for the character? And so you know, in the stories where there's a family, there's always uh, a character who is both caring for somebody and then being cared for um, throughout the story. So you know, we cast a shadow, the father is trying to care for his son. The son is actually very uh, loving towards the father. Um, in, uh, in, in short stories that I've written, uh, or like the chicken is a good example of that. I mean, I think that kid is trying so hard to sort of be protective of his found family, these foster kids. Um, and I think the reason why I'm doing that in the stories is because I think that at the end of the day, all we have is us in this world. I mean, there's, you know, there's money and, and there's sort of material goods and there's home. But I think in some of my stories, like literally in the story um, Fast Hands, Fast Feet, where all the characters are unhoused, like the idea there is that even if you have nothing at all, you know, you have no money, no home, you know, no future, no career, no education. You know, in that story, you know, Sarge and the girls and the narrator, they have each other. And, you know, maybe it doesn't make their life, you know, perfect or like wonderful, but it does give them some refuge from the sort of storms of being a person in this society. Um, and so I guess to answer the question for me, you know, trauma is about understanding how people can come together and team up to form a, a, a shield around what the world's trying to do to us. Because I think we all need that in our lives. And I think that to be lonely is maybe like the true devastation. Um, and my characters, for the most part, are working against that loneliness. That's how they find each other in the stories. Oh, that's a marvelous image, the image of the shield. I love that. Um, that, that now is, is guiding my, will guide my rereading of, of your collection, certainly. Um, the solidarity that kind of comes through in that collection, I think, is is palpable. But the shield is a lovely image. It's as though they're going, um, what's the phrase, in testudo, um, pulling shields together 
to make one large shield, um, which is which is a very kind um, and, and, and loving approach, I think, on the part of of an author to the characters. I'm trying to remember who it was. Um, uh, oh, I think it was. Oh, I think it may have been Peter Carey, and I, I hate myself if I'm wrong about this, but somebody asked, um, you know, uh, was, was there any fault that they saw in Peter Carey's fiction? Um, and, and somebody said, well, it, the only, it's, it's only that he loves his characters too much, that he shouldn't <laughs> love characters as much. Um, but of course, that's hardly a flaw, I think, um, for, the, for the artist, in the case you, um, in, in this artist and humor as well, right, is part of this solidarity that that happens across the the I mean differently certainly across the novel and the short stories. Um, it cuts through, I think, the strong bite of satire. Um, it does so through style and surrealism, and then it does so, I think, quite singularly in the person. I'm going to mention one character that I, I know I want us both to talk about a little bit before we begin to start unfolding towards some questions. Um, I'm interested in the um, female characters in your novel and one that I think we're both thinking might not, she gets your love but and mine, but might not have been attended to quite as well is Minty or Araminta and I would just love to know what went into making that young character that child whom the narrator at several points calls the pest because she's the friend of his son his son he's trying to protect and make into a sort of a, a new person tell me about minty well first of all thank you so much for that i mean you know on different days if you ask me which characters i like the most or who do i like to see the most or think about the most it may change day to day but i think most often i say Araminta. so you know um, to me, she's kind of the epitome of what I love about my people, my community. Mm -hmm. um, I'm thinking about you know, my grandmother, my mother. I'm thinking about my aunties. I'm thinking about how, like, even as a young man, you know, a young black man from the South, like, I might get annoyed with the fact that, like, those women would say, you need to do this, boy. I'm like, watch out for that kind of thing. I didn't really understand it. But now I look back and I see it was all about love and about care. And so even though on the page, I mean, she's a young girl, I think at the beginning of the book, she's like nine or 10 years old. Mm -hmm. Somehow she understands the situation better than most other characters in the book, you know, better than the narrator's wife, better than his boss, you know, better than his associates, better than other people, even better than the narrator himself, probably. Um, and the fact that, again, that this sort of like this sort of care linkage, I mean, in a certain way, she is the primary defender of Nigel. Um, but it's not her only function. She has her own life. I mean, she's literally one of these children who's like taking care of herself. She's you know, her parents and family are gone. She's living at the house by herself. And yet again, you know, it's this idea of like taking care of yourself is one thing, but caring for somebody else is, is like a higher level. You know, I, I've heard, um, I, have, I have a degree in psychology, I have a master's in psychology. And I've heard um, therapists talk about the idea that sometimes when somebody is having a hard time in their life, they recommend that they, that they go out and volunteer, you know, help somebody in, in the world. And that can often cure a lot of what is anxiety producing or depression inducing. Um, and so I think for a lot of my characters, and Araminta is like maybe the best example of that, you know, whatever she's going through, she's trying to deal with her own life by helping Nigel and maybe helping the family at large. Um, you know, she's named after, you know, an activist from the past, um, you know, one of our great leaders. Um, I just feel like Without that character, the book is a lot darker and bleaker and less funny, and it's just it's just not as good of a world. And I think that in a lot of my stories, there are women and girls like that who have this this sort of self containment and they're there to do good. You know, uh, villains be damned. You know, they'll they'll get, they'll get their shots in at some point, and she does exactly that. I think in a lot of ways, like this, I hear some like sort of sports guys like ask about like who won the game, like kind of all the players who won the game. In a lot of ways, she wins the game because she really is uh, so composed and so determined to do good throughout the book. And I love watching her work, basically. Yes, and she worked, and she is, I mean, I think of her sometimes as a, a sometimes um, when I've come back to reread her as a, as a teacher in this novel as well. And, and I think, you know, before we hear some questions, I do want to, to acknowledge, well, a lot of what I've heard about you as a teacher. I know that you've taught at Suwanee and our 
beloved as a teacher and also what I've seen um, on your public Twitter account, which is, makes it very clear to anyone who looks and, and reads that you teach through amplifying voices of other writers. You're, you're kind of the, one of the most supportive people. <laughs> one of the most supportive people I've seen on social media full stop uh, of other writers and letting writers that you know um in your group in your community that that they they too can make fiction and and I've I've enjoyed um I've enjoyed dipping into that I just wanted to acknowledge that as we're as we're talking about Minty and our and, and favoring her as well but let's hear some um uh thought and questions from our audience this evening you know as they come and you and I can also chat a little bit um if if people are shy because we're not shy um I have a I have a couple of questions here yeah. um thank you Bill by the way for 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 taking the questions oh of course of course um Maurice, you talked about getting out of the way um uh, as you write you know getting getting yourself out of the way and I I think about you know our self editors and the way we we let something come forward that you know might be difficult for us emotionally to to let come out, but also um, you know there's this question of of tapping into characters who might be very different from yourself and and the people around you. So could you talk a bit about giving yourself permission to channel the voices of characters that you might not intimately know at the outset? It might not be like anyone in your life. I know that's it's been such a, a big question <laughs> recently and, and for quite a long time. And, and you seem to really have uh, taken it on. Yeah, yeah, no, thank you for that. I mean, there've been so many essays written about it. I mean, one I liked most recently was Alex Chee's essay where he talks about that exact topic. And, you know, I feel like every time I think about this topic, I have a different answer because it's such a complex thing. But I think now what I think is, Writers should try to write their community. What I mean by that is not just people who look and sound like you necessarily, but people that you know. You know, if if you are an American from um, Idaho to use from, you know, from the story, for example, and then you decide to like write a story that is set in, I don't know, Malaysia or something like that. That's a pretty big stretch. I'm not saying that it should, you should be barred from that, but you know, Alex would say, well, you know, why are you trying to do that? When I write my short stories, when I write the novel we got shadow in the book that I'm, that I'm working on right now, you know, it's not that big of a stretch for me because on the one hand, I am writing what I don't know. These are fictional characters. I'm not live their lives. You know, I didn't interview these people for their stories, that kind of thing. But on, but on the other hand, I know them. I know their concerns. I know the soul that made them, that they, that they grew out of. Um, I know how, how they're going to respond to questions. You know, I know that if I take, um, you know, the character from the short story just now, like put them on a spaceship, you know, across the galaxy in like a, you know, a Star Wars, Star Trek thing. I know what he's going to say to those aliens. I just know that he's, he's my people, you see? And so, you know, whether the character is um, a woman or a girl or, uh, you know, queer or transgender, whether they're older or younger, whether there's somebody living in 1844 or somebody living in, you know, uh, 2118, it's my community. And sure, sometimes those characters are white or Asian American, or Asian, or um, you know Latinx, but that's that's my that's my people, and so I, it's, it's not a big stress for me to do that. And so I think that people get in trouble sometimes because you know as Roxanne Gay said on an interview a few weeks ago or a couple months ago, now she said you know really the problem comes from when the characters are written poorly or when the story doesn't quite work because the writers didn't know what they were doing and they didn't know the community, they didn't know the voices or the concerns, and therefore it just feels totally fake. Kind of like when I. You know, I love like um, old sci-fi. I remember watching one of the early episodes of Doctor Who. And because it was this British show from like the 60s or 70s, you know, they, they, they go to like uh, like Mesoamerica and it's like, this like the Aztecs. It's like just British guys with like face paint on and it just feels so cheesy, you know? Now, obviously they had limitations at that time. They couldn't like find action that area from the part of the world, whatever, but it just feels so wrong. And to me, I think as a writer, you should question that. You know, don't write what you know necessarily, but definitely write what feels like you have uh, a connection to it. I mean, and that's the, that's like the jumping off point of your foundation. Otherwise, you make mistakes you can't even see, and you look back and go, "Wow, why did I do that? I should have known better." Um, yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, so, a, a question from our assistant fiction editor Amber Karen. Um, she says, "I love what you said about your characters working against loneliness." 
Can you say a little more about how that works in your stories and how you use that to propel the writing process? Sure. Well, you know, I think um, I think from the moment that we as humans um, are disconnected from our mother, loneliness becomes a problem. You know, um, it, you know, it, it, it's a wonderful thing that mothers give to us in this world, and we know that that person loves us forever. But unfortunately, you know, most of your life, you know, ninety nine point nine nine percent of your life. You're out in the world and you're trying to find warmth, you're trying to find connection, you're trying to find a place. And I, I think that, you know, at, at the very essence, that's probably what every single story is about. You know, whether it's like some Greek hero with a sword and sandals running, running across and kill some monster, or whether it's like, you know, some lady in the South in a book trying to find her place in the world. Um, and so for me, you know, um, I love stories that sort of forefront that, that sort of feeling uh, of trying to make a connection with, with, with with, with the world through some other person. You know, we cast a shadow at, at the end of the day is this father saying, I can see this devastation that my child may confront at some point. And I wanna be the person that provides some protection for that. He doesn't like the solution. He sees it's kind of absurd, even sort of wrongheaded. But, you know, one day when he, the father is gone, he wants to imagine his child on earth doing well for himself. And a lot of my characters like that. They're trying to just provide this space for, these, for, for somebody they love to exist peacefully and happily. Um, and I think that, you know, I mean, personally, you know, I don't tell writers how to write their work, but I do think that there are too many writers who are against this idea of engaging with the feeling of loneliness and trying to find connection. A lot of writers try and play it really cool. They try and act as if like these characters don't need anybody or anything. And that to me feels authentic also. You know, I mean, being too cool for school, you know, it's fine if the writing is, is, is well done and the way the words and the sentences work. But that sort of coldness in the narrative to me strikes me as very false. Mm -hmm. I think even the slickest, coolest writer in the world, whoever that person is for you, is somebody who has these same issues running in their mind all the time. They, they won't say it out loud because they're so cool. The same with musicians and actors. But it's, in, it's inside them at some place. And um, to me, as a writer, it's the most honest thing possible to have that just right there on the page, um, from the first page to the last, these characters telling you who they are, what they feel, or what they need. Because at the end of the day, we need other people. You know, I think that even the even the meanest person would hate to be the last person on earth. And my characters are, are a reflection of that sort of feeling. I love that you that you put it in those terms, Maurice, because it, it, especially the idea of characters that don't need anyone or anything that might even be too cool, that are too cool for school, because, you know, there was a kind of trend some years ago, and maybe it has abated now of characters sort of disappearing from their lives, you know? maybe going halfway across the world, um, turning up in an island, escaping. Um, and, and it led to certainly a kind of flatness and a deflation in, in the writing and in any kind of humanity, I think, in the character. So it's, it's really refreshing to hear your, your corrective <laughs> to the cool, cool disappearances in fiction. A lot of them were women, I think, that disappeared, which kind of troubled me as well but let me not take any more time from other people thank you so another question what is your writing routine and how do you write on days when the words won't come like a situation where you feel stuck in the middle of a story yeah um my routine is that i have no routine i mean i think that your writing self is probably very similar to your regular self um i was a corporate lawyer for years and probably the two worst things about that part of my life was one, being expected to show up at the office at the same time every day, work a certain number of hours and leave at the same time. And then secondly, billable hours, like writing now what I was doing constantly, it just felt so oppressive. I think that for me as a writer, what I love the most is that I can wake up and not know what my day is gonna hold. You know, I, I may get up and read for three hours, you know, like cook some breakfast and then just, you know, read, read a book of poems. Or I may decide, you know what, I don't really wanna work on the novel that I've been writing, I'm gonna, um, I'm going to write an essay because somebody wants to send something in for their magazine. Um, and so, you know, I think that for many writers, that idea of like writing every single day can be very corrosive. I think because if you miss a few days, you begin to feel guilty and shame. And I told myself a long time ago, like in this space as a writer, which is like my special place to feel my best, I don't want to feel any shame or guilt. And I want to create work that doesn't do any harm. And I want to work in a way that makes me feel better when I finish and when I start. When I get stuck um, on writing things, and you know, that's a real thing, you know, writer's block or whatever, or distractions or, you know, uh, stress, those, those can be things that affect your writing. 
But what it really comes down to for me is, is knowing the character and knowing that that character has an urgent thing that they need in their life. And so I'm writing the story, or I'm writing the novel, and, and I get to a place like, what happens next? And again, I ask that question, you know, what happens next to like the voice and what's, and, and you know, leave out the boring stuff. And, and why does it matter? You know, if this character can justify like why they're telling me the thing, I can figure out, you know, what to do, what to do next. And, and, you know, to a certain extent writing a, a novel, especially is like jumping out of an airplane with no parachute, hoping you can find a parachute on the way down at some point. And so I've gotten to a place where I feel like that's how it works. You know, I may get stuck. I may take a few wrong turns, like write three scenes in a row that will not make it to the final product, but it's okay. If I can get you that draft and kind of go, oh, I see what here is vital, what really matters. Go back into the draft, begin to cut things out, add things in, and even like interview the character. I've interviewed my characters like, they open a document, hey, the thing you said on page 42, why'd you say that? And they'll go, well, this is what I said. And I'll go, what'd you really mean by that? Just keep on asking the questions, asking the questions, and drawing, you know, the thread out of the out of the fabric. Um, and so, you know, I think for a writer to wrap this answer up, it's a matter of sort of knowing yourself, knowing what your distractions are, knowing what holds you back, and then remembering at the end of the day, the stories want to get out. And so, again, get out of your own way. Let the stories flow as much as possible you can, because it's not about you and your ego, about what you want. It's about the story itself. Let that story exist in the world on its own. Someone in your life told you that you could write, and every time you write, you honor them. Uh, this person says, I love that tweet that you've pinned. Who was that person for you? Oh, my goodness. I mean, it was actually a few people. And, and yeah, that, that tweet, um, I, I smile thinking about it. It's like my, like my top tweet, I think, maybe of all time. It's got like 20-something, 30-something thousand um, likes on it. But um, and it's funny, with that tweet in particular, I posted that for writers. You know, I was trying to remind writers that the urge to write should come from a place of love. You know, somebody in your life, your mama, your cousin, a friend in school, a, a teacher in high school was like, hey, you know what? You can write. And that should sort of launch you off. So for me, as many people. I mean, you know, I, I remember when I was in high school, probably like a, a, like a sophomore or a junior, um, just some, like one of the coaches, I think it was, it was a woman coach. She was like, you know, I heard you read something in one of the classes. Can you come to the Thanksgiving sort of assembly and like, just like make something about, right, read, read something about Thanksgiving for, for your classmates. And so that may have been the first person who ever said that to me. It was like, you know what? I think you're a good writer. I trust you. Make a brand new thing about Thanksgiving and families. And just read for like 10 minutes in front of like, you know, 300 other students. And that's what I did. And I was nervous. I'm sure it wasn't that great. <laughs> but at the same time, you know, I think back to those kinds of moments and think that, you know, everybody on this earth has a sort of purpose and we have many different skills that we can uh, tap into. It takes another person to be our mirror and say, hey, you have this special gift. You should double down on it. So I think, you know, it'll be good for all of us to have you presenting that gift to the world. And to, to write is a gift. I, I believe that truly. I'm curious about, this is not me, I'm, but the person asking this question. I'm curious about your process for writing the ending to the ones who don't say they love you story, whether you explore different endings or if this felt singular and right. Oh yeah, thank you. These are great questions by the way from uh, the people in the audience. Um, so a funny story about the ending of this story, or I never told you, I never uh, told anybody this like an interview, but so, that story I wrote at a time when I had just finished grad school and I was really stalling out. I feel like my stories were just not coming to life where I wanted them to. And so I gave myself a task of write a story in which there's like just no boundaries. Like you can be as weird or angry, whatever you want to be, just let it flow and use that. And, um, and so I did that and I wrote the story and I um, sent it off to a bunch of magazines that got rejected many, many times. I mean, well over a dozen times. So I remember sitting in, you know, sitting at home one day and thinking, well, I should probably like, you know, revise the story and make it, make it brand new, like just start from scratch and overhaul the entire thing. And as I'm doing that, I got the notice from iReview that it had won their prize. And I was like, wait, what, what, what? Okay, so that happens. And then I'm like, you know, they're like, so we want to like, you know, go through the ed editing process with you. And the editor, it was the first time this ever happened. They said, you know, 
we have we have one basic edit. We want you to cut out the last like paragraph. And I was like kind of stunned, but also kind of like, okay, you know, what's this about? And the original ending had like a like a, a few more beats where the character is kind of like walking towards that car and thinking about what his future might hold. And I give them credit for it. The cutting that last bit out makes it more elegant, makes it more impactful, I think. I think it's the reason why that story is so memorable to so many readers. Because you can almost never cut too much. I'm a big fan of cutting. Um, I really don't have a lot of like ego when it comes to like editing my work. If somebody says, you know, you need to pare this down and make it shorter or cut a few pages, um, you know, probably 80% of the time I want to agree to that without even asking the question of why. And there's very few points where it's like, well, you know, I really like that part a lot and we'll have a discussion, but even now I'll probably cut the thing. And so that ending from a technical standpoint is one of my friends told me in grad school that her mentor had said to her, try to end on a strong image. And so the idea of this sort of like this police car is coming towards the main character in the French Quarter, the lights are blinking real slow with the car speeding up. You know, that image is a reflection of one of the earlier images, like the first page, but it's also a police car with the very lights, you know, blue, uh, blue, right, red, whatever it is. Um, and so those little moments can, can create like a resonance where the reader goes, wow, why am I feeling something? Why, why am I feeling feelings right now? I love that kind of stuff. Images are really good at that. Images and language um, can really make a reader just have this experience that is very uh, spiritual, I think. Could you talk about the great use of humor in your work, how intentionally you weave it in, how consciously it's part of your craft? That comes natural from being Black, <laughs> being from the South, and being from New Orleans in particular. Um, you know, I, I think that uh, you know, as a people, we've seen so many things in our, in, in our generations of living on this earth. Um, and I think that, you know, for my elders, you know, just watching them move through life, just seeing them do it with so much grace and so much humor. You know, I don't have a lot of elders in my life who have passed by now where I think, wow, that was a really angry person. They, they were just always, my, my grandfather, he, he worked for city sanitation, drove a dump truck, drove street sweepers during parades. He uh, picked up garbage, he um, cut grass. Um, man was always smiling, always joking around, just like a very delightful person. My dad, same way, my mother, the same way. And so I think that also, particularly New Orleans, it's an interesting place because we've always been on the edge of annihilation. You know, whether it was the city being burned down like twice in the 1700s, then again in the 1800s, whether it's the perpetual hurricanes and flooding, whether it's the yellow um, fever that hit us like 10 times in like the 1800s and, and killed thousands of people. Um, I think that for us, we have all of those things that have happened. Then we also have this parade, like, you know what? You can't take us out. We're gonna have a parade. It's gonna be a big parade. You know, make your red beans, make your gumbo, make your jambalaya. We're gonna take the pots out to the intersection in the gas station. We're gonna watch the floats pass by. The whole family is here, even cousin who just got out of jail. It's gonna be a great time today. And, and like this just feeling of like, just, you know, you can choose how you how how you want to feel in life. You can have a, you can have a tough life where there's not enough money, not enough food. There's racism, there's misogyny, and you're sad and you're angry. Or you can have all those things, but you know you're playing with the dog. You know you're you're joking around with the child. You know you are you know telling somebody a joke. You are uh, you're looking your best. Those are all New Orleans things. And so I think that in my stories, which can be very dark sometimes. The idea is to express like my community, which is always saying, we're going to have fun regardless. There's a hurricane coming, we're going to be all right. We've seen this before, we'll see it again. Wonderful. I think that's the questions that we have. Great question. Great it's questions. Very... Yes, and I'm, I'm really glad that somebody followed up on, on that question of, of humor. Um, I think I see the audience member. Um, and, and, and to hear you say more about that, to build out what we were kind of thinking about in a little way, um, particularly when it comes to We Cast a Shadow, because of course that's the, that's the great tension of this novel, is the humor of the writing, the surrealism that goes along with that, the tension whereby we're not fully sure if the narrator will ever come to terms, um, 
and I it's so hard for me not to say more because I want people to read this novel and I'm trying to not spoil any plots but all of that tension is born along through humor and just extraordinary language as well um there's nothing as funny on certain pages as a Maurice Ruffin sentence um and I, I I love I love the language in this novel dearly um and I think anyone who comes across it for the first time will too and I encourage you all to do that thank you so much for joining us this evening Maurice I've been waiting for quite some time for this evening um I've looked forward to it and and you've been so generous um to my inquiries and probings and also to our audiences um, thank you on behalf of Agni for joining us and can I ask one tiny question you've hinted now twice if not three times about the fact that you're working on a novel it would be remiss of me if I didn't try to winkle something about that from you <laughs> I know you can't talk much about it but can you no I can't us? You can. Okay, go on a little bit. Yeah, look, I mean, look, most writers are like, oh, don't ask me what I'm working on. You know, to figure out. I'm always of the school of I'm talking about the thing that I'm writing so I can figure it out in real time. Um, and, and, you know, before I say that, I just want to say thank you for having me tonight. This has been wonderful. And thank you for publishing me all those years ago. You changed my life for the better. I really appreciate that. Um, so the book that I'm writing now is part of the same mission. You know, I'm trying to write about my community trying to write about the people um, in the history of my city who helped make it what it is, who have been part of this submerged population. Um, basically, the idea was that I had done research on my genealogy, um, and I decided to focus on the women in my family. Mm -hmm. And there were a lot of blank spots, and there were things I couldn't get my, my hands on. And Sadia Hartman has this idea of uh, creative fabulation, where people who are from communities that have been somewhat erased from history you can fill in the blanks with narrative. You can sort of make things up, make the story make sense. And so the, the book that I'm writing now, um, which is in very good shape, I think, is about um, a young girl and her mother. Um, in 1844, they are brought to New Orleans by a slave owner. And I wanted to write a book in which we focus particularly on that main character, that girl who was, I think, six or eight years old when the book starts off. And I wanted to follow her through this sort of journey of, um, looking at the women around her, her mother, um, other elders, and then later she meets some other young women in the city who are actually free people of color. And she begins to understand that you know, a lot of things that society is telling her about her life not having worth and about her not having a future, she sees that they're all lies. And she can create a future for herself. She can push back, fight back, uh, create her own identity. And you know, to me, it's a very um, inspirational work because I know that women like her really existed, is that we don't have their stories. And so I'm trying to create the story. And, and, and in a sort of plot sense, um, um, when the Union attacked the Confederates in New Orleans, the Confederates did not fight back. They basically like just ran for the hills. And I've always wondered why that is. And so this book makes the argument that it's because there was a group of women, Black women, in New Orleans and across the country sabotaging those guys for decades. And so she becomes one of those people who she's like tearing them apart from, from, from behind the scenes. Um, and it's just, it's just fun to think about. So I know that the women that I know would be doing whatever they can to protect their families and you know, destroy the destroyers. What could be more exciting for us to hear at the end of this evening than Maurice Ruffin taking up Sadia Hartman's work, work that I love, um, and her injunction towards, towards creative fabulisms. Thank you for thank you for giving us that preview, and thanks for thank joining you. us. Thank you so much. Thank you to both of you for doing this. It's it's been wonderful. Um, I want to tell everybody before we go that we have two more events this fall. You'll find registration links in the chat. Cynthia Ayeza, who's been managing the chat, thank you for that. Cynthia is going to add those on Monday, October seventeenth. The four chief editors of Agni, from its founding to the present, will hold a roundtable on the history of the magazine and on literary magazine's place in the wider literary ecology. Um, our associate editor, Shuchi Saraswat, will moderate that discussion. And then um, an event we're announcing publicly for the first time tonight, WBUR City Space is hosting a major celebration in person and online to cap off our 50th anniversary. On Friday, November 4th, Robert Pinsky will MC readings by Karen Balin, Joanne Beard, Victoria Chang, Teju Cole, 
Shonda Feldman and Robert himself with a performance by the band Meridian 71. Be sure to get tickets early. Uh, we think it will hopefully sell out in person and uh, there is no cap to the number of people online, but that's ticketed also. Uh, and that's it. Thank you to Brookline Booksmith, Boston University, the National Endowment for the Arts and the Mass Cultural Council.